Well, hello and welcome. Uh, this is Bread Theory, where we talk about uh, leftist audiobooks. We're going to go through them chapter by chapter and discuss the relevance to today, as well as uh, look at them through the frame of uh, modern theories such as new urbanism, uh, permaculture, and also anarcho-communism. Uh, and as, as it so happens, um, our, our book this week is the first chapter of The Conquest of Bread. Perhaps one of the, uh, I'm going to turn this down for one second, because it's getting loud on my ears. Uh, is perhaps one of the, the most famous works of uh, the anarcho-communist theory, or, or school of thought, I should say. Um Written by Peter Kropotkin, uh, it, it lays out his theory for a, uh, a society that is cashless, moneyless, um, and where everyone is provided for, regardless of their ability to work, their ability... Oh, I'm frozen, huh? Great. Hopefully I've unfrozen now. Hi. Um, anyway... So he's going to lay out his vision for a society post-revolution where all the, the means of production have been directly seized by the people and uh, new organizations are being formed to equitably and, and fairly distribute uh, all the surpluses that, uh, you know, until that point have been locked up in the, the storehouses and, and the factories and the, and the shops of the owner class, the ruling class. Um, so he's going to talk about uh, his vision for a life after that, a life uh, where, like I said, things are, are more equitably distributed and everyone is provided for. Uh, so this uh, particular recording is another LibriVox. Uh, they, they do, for those who aren't aware, they do... Um, uh, just free audiobooks of, of mostly public domain, or well, all public domain books. Uh, and this one in particular is a collaboration between LibriVox and Audible Anarchism, which uh, I gave a link to in the last video. So without further ado, I think we're going to get to the book. Uh, one more thing, the, the uh, game this week, I'm going to do a, a different game for each book, and, and the one I've selected for this one is Sim Tower, the classic game from 1997 or something like that. Um, and it's a pretty kind of it's kind of a chill game, you know. You you, you build little by little your office uh, and condo complex, um, and yeah, uh, let's get to the audiobook though. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the music for now. Let me know if you like the music, if it, if it helps you concentrate and digest things a little better, or if you prefer um, just having it without. So here we go with The Conquest of Bread, Chapter 1. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Let's check the levels on that. The um, Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. Chapter 1. Our Riches. Part 1. The human race has traveled far since those bygone ages when men used to fashion their rude implements of flint and lived on the precarious spoils of the chase, leaving to their children for their only heritage a shelter beneath the rocks, some poor utensils, in nature, vast, ununderstood, and terrific, with whom they had to fight for their wretched existence. During the agitated times which collapsed since and which have lasted for many thousand years, mankind has nevertheless amassed untold treasures. It has cleared the land, dried the marshes, pierced the forests, made roads. It has been building, inventing, observing, reasoning. It has created a complex machinery, wrested her secrets from nature, and finally it has made a servant of steam. And the result is that now the child of the civilized man finds ready at its birth to his hand an immense capital accumulated by those who have gone before him, and this capital enables him to acquire, merely by his own labor, combined with the labor of others, riches surpassing the dreams of the Orient, 
expressed in the fairy tales of the Thousand and One Nights. The soil is cleared to a great extent, fit for the reception of the best seeds, ready to make a rich return for the skill and labor spent upon it, a return more than sufficient for all the wants of humanity. The methods of cultivation are known. On the wide prairies of America, each hundred men, with the aid of powerful machinery, can produce in a few months enough wheat to maintain 10,000 people for a whole year. And where a man wishes to double his produce, to triple it, to multiply it a hundredfold, he makes the soil, gives to each plant the requisite care, and thus obtains enormous returns. While the hunter of old had to scour 50 or 60 square miles to find food for his family, the civilized man supports his household with far less pains and far more certainty on a thousandth part of that space. It's been a long time the since climate I is no this longer game. an obstacle. When the sun fails, man replaces it by artificial heat, and we see the coming of a time when artificial light also will be used to stimulate vegetation. Meanwhile, by the use of glass and hot water pipes, man renders a given space 10 and 50 times more productive than it was in its natural state. The prodigies accomplished in industry are still more striking. With the cooperation of those intelligent beings, modern machines, themselves the fruit of three or four generations of inventors, mostly unknown, a hundred men manufacture now the stuff to clothe 10,000 persons for a period of two years. In well-managed coal mines, the labor of a hundred miners furnishes each year enough fuel to warm 10,000 families under an inclement sky. And we have lately witnessed twice the spectacle of a wonderful city springing up in a few months in Paris, without interrupting in the slightest degree the regular work of the French nation. And if in manufactures, as in agriculture, and as indeed through our whole social system, the labor, the discoveries, and the inventions of our ancestors profit chiefly the few. It is nonetheless certain that mankind in general, aided by the creatures of steel and iron which it already possesses, could already procure an existence of wealth and ease for every one of its members. Truly, we are rich, far richer than we think, rich in what we already possess, richer still in the possibilities of production of our actual mechanical outfit, richest of all in what we might win from our soil, from our manufacturers, from our... So basically what he's laying out so far is pretty similar to what we have today in that uh, he's talking about how we, we produce so much, so much more than is needed for every person, and yet people still go hungry. I mean, uh, look at the effects of that in, in Texas recently where there's uh, supplies abound in the country and yet people are, are resorting to... Uh, desperate means to, to get food. Um, and this doesn't even have to happen during uh, crisis times. This, this happens a lot where we have homeless people, we have people that are, that no one really starves in the U.S. anyway, but still people go without, they skip meals, they're, they're food insecure. And yet, uh, oh, that's, that's right. That's why I, I was going to bring up uh, Texas. They, they were talking about how uh, there was police in one city who were guarding a, a, a dumpster so that homeless people couldn't pick food out of the dumpster that 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 a, a um, that a, a, a grocery store had thrown away perfectly good food um, and that was the best use of police in their mind was to, was to make sure that homeless people didn't get that food how crazy in a time like that where, where that's the priority not protecting people protecting stuff garbage in their minds uh it's just it's a bizarre system that that favors the business owner and the property owner over even human life and human dignity um yeah so that, that's that's strange but you know a lot of parallels today capitalism has not changed that much in in that regard in fact, if anything, we have even more stuff. We have way more of an abundance of stuff. There's several houses for every homeless person that, that sit bank, vacant, just waiting for the right price to uh, to to sell. These these are the land speculating class. They contribute absolutely nothing to the world. Uh, they just they 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 have the the means to to sit on uh, land and 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 wait for the right price. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of sickening abundance and, you know, good on capitalism for producing so well for, you know, potentially for everybody. But uh, at the same time, if things are not equitably 
you know, even at a minimum distributed, then, you know, it's not a system that works for the masses. Well, let's continue on. Science from our technical knowledge were they but applied to bring about the well-being of all. Chapter 1, Part 2. We in civilized societies are rich. Why then are the many poor? Why this painful drudgery for the masses? Why, even to the best paid workmen, this uncertainty for the morrow, in the midst of all the wealth inherited from the past, and in spite of the powerful means of production, which could ensure comfort to all in return for a few hours of daily toil. The socialists have said it and repeated it unwaringly. Daily they reiterate it, demonstrating it by arguments taken from all the sciences. It is because all that is necessary for production, the land, the mines, the highways, machinery, food, shelter, education, knowledge, all have been seized by the few in the course of that long story of robbery, enforced migration and wars, of ignorance and oppression, which has been the life of the human race before it had learned to subdue the forces of nature. It is because, taking advantage of alleged rights acquired in the past, these few appropriate today two-thirds of the products of human labor, and then squander them in the most stupid and shameful way. It is because... And that's another important principle of uh, anarchism. It's the idea of where do property rights uh, derive from? How do they gain legitimacy and where do they get their power from to, to have force of law behind them. In a, in a book that we're going to cover uh, later on, What is Property? by, by one of the fathers of communism, uh, Proudhon, uh, he talks about how basically if you go back far enough, it doesn't matter if it's a, a family that's lived on the land for generation after generation, if you go back far enough, there's been, uh, I guess you call it a crime, committed to attain that land, whether it's conquering someone else, whether it's, it's, it's buying them out through unfair leverage, whether it's, uh, you know, doing something to, to cause the, them to leave. That's, that's not outright stealing, but saying, oh, well, this is free land. I guess it's, it's mine now. Um, so that's what, that's what they were talking about. Uh, that's what Kropotkin is talking about in this chapter, how, you know, you look around in society, you, you, you just, you can, you can take it for granted that of course somebody owns this, somebody owns that. But I mean, you go back far enough and do they really, is that really a legitimate right they have? Or do they just stake their claim and say, basically, you know, I challenge you to uh, say otherwise. And then if it, it gets down to it, they always have the force of law and, and law enforcement to back up their claim. So it's always a claim, a threat of violence that is at the root of, of all of these, these private property claims. And again, we're talking about private property. I've mentioned in, in previous streams, there's a difference between private property, which is uh, the, the, the machinery, the factories, the, the, the uh, physical structures um, and the materials needed to uh, make a living, uh, to do business, um, and that would also include rental properties because that's how a, a landlord makes their money, you know. Um, and then there's all then there's personal property, which is just what you use to continue your life. You know, your personal home, your personal stuff you use to maintain your life, your food, that sort of thing. So um, again, difference between personal property and private property. Having reduced the masses to a point in which they have not the means of subsistence for a month or even a week in advance, the few only allow the many to work on condition of themselves receiving the lion's share. It is because these few prevent the remainder of men from producing the things they need and force them to produce, not the necessaries of life for all, but whatever offers the greatest profits to the monopolists. In this is the substance of all socialism. Take indeed a civilized country, the forest which once covered it had been cleared, the marshes drained, the climate improved, it has been made habitable. The soil, which bore formerly only a coarse vegetation, is covered today with rich harvests. The rock walls and the valleys are laid out in terraces and covered with vines bearing golden fruit. The wild plants, which yielded not but acrid berries or uneatable roots, 
have been transformed by generations of culture into succulent vegetables or trees covered with delicious fruits. Thousands of highways and railroads furrow the earth and pierce the mountains. The shriek of the engine is heard in the wild gorges of the Alps, the Caucasus, and the Himalayas. The rivers have been made navigable. The coasts, carefully surveyed, are easy of access. Artificial harbors, laboriously dug out and protected against the fury of the sea, afford shelter to the ships. Deep shafts have been sunk in the rocks. Labyrinths of underground galleries have been dug out where coal may be raised or minerals extracted. At the crossings of the highways, great cities have sprung up, and within their borders, all the treasures of industry, science, and art have been accumulated. Whole generations that lived and died in misery, oppressed and ill-treated by their masters, and worn out by toil, have handed on this immense inheritance to our century. For thousands of years, millions of men have labored to clear the forests, to drain the marshes, and to open up highways by land and water. Every root of soil we cultivate in Europe has been watered by the sweat of several races of men. I think there's some theories of new urbanism and as well as permaculture that can be applied here. What he's, what he's talking about is what are cities for? Uh, are they just a, or a, happen to be a collection of people that, that live in, in one spot and, and, and labor together and, and share things? Or are they uh, constructs of labor uh, organized on purpose by the people that own the means of production to have a pool of, of human workers to uh, toil in their mills to um, you know to, to act as, as human resources uh, I think is a good way to put it um, so you know uh, is that is that really a, a way to organize society uh, to well, let's, let's apply it to permaculture to use and value diversity? Are we are we valuing the diversity of, of minds that, that congregate in one city, or are we focusing on uh, a handful of the lucky few who happen to have been born into the right family that already has a legacy of power in the area? Um, are we valuing uh, a diversity of, of living situations, or do we just value diversity for those with means, and everyone else can just kind of, you know, fight over the the drab and and uh, and crowded um, lower class uh, habitations. Um, and, and just from a new urbanist perspective, is this the best way to, to foster actual community? Like, there's no real thought to community, in, in, especially in, in Kropotkin's time when industrial towns were popping up all over the place and, and without much thought or, or planning uh, other than how can we get the most people in the, the smallest space to uh, serve our needs as, as owners. So... Uh, yeah, just keep those in mind as, as we go along. Every acre has its story of enforced labor, of intolerable toil, of the people's suffering. Every mile of railway, every yard of tunnel, has received its share of human blood. The shafts of the mine still bear on their rocky walls the marks made by the pick of the workmen who toiled to excavate them. The space between each prop and the underground galleries might be marked as a miner's grave. And who can tell what each of these graves has cost, in tears, in privations, in unspeakable wretchedness to the family who depended on the scanty wage of the worker cut off in his prime by fire damp, rockfall, or flood. The cities, bound together by railroads and waterways, are organisms which have lived through centuries. Dig beneath them and you find, one above another, the foundations of streets, of houses, of theaters, of public buildings, Search into their history and you will see how the civilization of the town, its industry, its special characteristics, have slowly grown and ripened through the cooperation of generations of its inhabitants before it could become what it is today. And even today, the value of each dwelling, factory, and warehouse, which has been created by the accumulated labor of the millions of workers, now dead and buried, 
is only maintained by the very presence and labor of legions of the men who now inhabit that special corner of the globe. Each of the atoms composing what we call the wealth of nations owes its value to the fact that it is part of the great whole. What would a London dockyard or a great Paris warehouse be if they were not situated in these great centers of international commerce? What would become of our mines, our factories, our workshops, and our railways without the immense quantities of merchandise transported every day by sea and land? Millions of human beings have labored to create this civilization on which we pride ourselves today. Other millions, scattered through the globe, labor to maintain it. Without them, nothing would be left in 50 years but ruins. There is not even a thought or an invention which is not common property, born of the past and the present. Thousands of inventors, known and unknown, who have died in poverty, have cooperated in the invention of each of these machines which embody the genius of man. Thousands of writers, of poets, of scholars, have labored to increase knowledge, to dissipate error, and to create that atmosphere of scientific thought without which the marvels of our century could never have appeared. And these thousands of philosophers, of poets, of scholars, of inventors have themselves been supported by the labor of past centuries. They have been upheld and nourished through life, both physically and mentally, by legions of workers and craftsmen of all sorts. They have drawn their motive force from the environment, the genius of a Seguin, a mayor, a Grove, has certainly done more to launch industry in new directions than all the capitalists in the world. But men of genius are themselves the children of industry as well as of science. Not until thousands of steam engines had been working for years before all eyes, constantly transforming heat into dynamic force, and this force into sound, light, and electricity, could the insight of genius proclaim the mechanical origin and the unity of the physical forces? And if we, children of the 19th century, have at last grasped this idea, if we know now how to apply it, it is again because daily experience has prepared the way. The thinkers of the 18th century saw and declared it, but the idea remained undeveloped, because the 18th century had not grown up like ours, side by side with the steam engine. Imagine the decades that might have passed while we remained in ignorance of this law, which has revolutionized modern industry, had Watt not found at Soho skilled workmen to embody his ideas in metal, bringing all the parts of his engine to perfection, so that steam, pent in a complete mechanism, and rendered more docile than a horse, more manageable than water, became at last the very soul of modern industry. Every machine has had the same history, a long record of sleepless nights and of poverty, of disillusions and of joys, of partial improvements discovered by several generations of nameless workers who have added to the original invention these little nothings, without which the most fertile idea would remain fruitless. More than that, every new invention is a synthesis, the resultant of innumerable inventions which have preceded it in the vast field of mechanics and industry. Science and industry. I want to pause the knowledge just for a second. Discovery and practical realization leading to new discovery. This is a very important part in the way that Kropotkin um, puts together his his view of ownership. He he says every invention builds on all the inventions that that start before it. It's absolutely true. It's not as though you have to invent fire in order to learn how to weld or to, to pour molten steel or, or whatever application you have. You don't have to mine the, learn how to mine the ore to put together uh, some metal machinery. No, you, you, you know, you connect up with people that already know that and they have built their knowledge on the knowledge of previous generations that have, have built up their knowledge of whatever it is, metallurgy or whatever the, the, the craft or the industry is uh, over the vast course of time so can you really say that you own uh, this idea or that idea? This plays in, in heavily with things like the idea of patenting things and copywriting things. Same sort of thing. Everyone that, that writes a book, even if it's you know your unique ideas, you're still drawing on knowledge that you got from someone else who they have drawn on knowledge from the past on and on through the generations. So who really owns it? Who is really responsible for it? And and you'll see that, that coming up right here, his conclusion is going to be 
everybody. It should be for everybody because everyone through the vast interlocking uh, course of, of human history has contributed to the modern day. So, I mean, you've probably stepped into buildings that are older than you and older than anyone living, you know? Who, who can really say that they own that just because they've taken it over, you know? It, it's, it's the idea of because everything comes from, from all of this interaction and cooperation of humanity, as, as I say, back through the ages, then all the products should be for everyone today because it is our, our common wealth uh, as humans that, that are cooperative, a cooperative species. That is our strength. Um, so it's a, a very different theory of, of property and ownership than perhaps a lot of uh, people in, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, first world nations, Western countries, whatever that means, industrialized nations, however you want to put it. Uh, people that, that follow capitalism tend to think of property very differently. And it's like, you know, I came up with a song, so therefore I should be able to profit from whoever plays that song uh, for any commercial gain, you know, through my lifetime, beyond my lifetime. I I should be able to pass down the the rights to that song uh, generation after generation. Um, But really, all that, that, that knowledge to make that song came from other people originally. All the melodies, the, the ways of, of reading music, of arranging music, is, is built off the backs of, of previous generations. So, yeah, is that is that really okay to just say I own this thing because I've rearranged it in a slightly different way than than uh, people of the past have? I don't think so. Breeze, cunning of brain and of hand, toil of mind and muscle, all work together. Each discovery, each advance, each increase in the sum of human riches owes its being to the physical and mental travail of the past and the present. By what right, then, can anyone whatever appropriate the least morsel of this immense whole and say, this is mine, not yours? Chapter 1, Part 3 It has come about, however, the course of the ages traversed by the human race, that all that enables man to produce and to increase his power of production has been seized by the few. Sometime, perhaps, we will relate how this came to be. So just a little time check. This is a short chapter. Um, we're going to just do one tonight, just to kind of ease into it. About halfway through. So we got about, um, we have just about, not even quite ten minutes left, about, about nine minutes left in this chapter. So it'll be a little bit of a shorter one tonight. Pass. For the present, let it suffice to state the fact and analyze its consequences. Today the soil, which actually owes its value to the needs of an ever-increasing population, belongs to a minority who prevent the people from cultivating it, or do not allow them to cultivate it according to modern methods. The mines, though they represent the labor of several generations, and derive their sole value from the requirements of the industry of a nation and the density of the population, the mines also belong to the few, and these few restrict the output of coal, or prevent it entirely, if they find more profitable investments for their capital. Machinery, too, has become the exclusive property of the few, and even when a machine incontestably represents the improvements added to the original rough invention by three or four generations of workers, it nonetheless belongs to a few owners. And if the descendants of the very inventor who constructed the first machine for lace making a century ago were to present themselves today in a lace factory at Ball or Nottingham and demand their rights, they would be told, hands off, this machine is not yours, and they would be shot down if they attempted to take possession of it. The railways, which would be useless as so much old iron without the teeming population of Europe, its industry, its commerce, and its marts, belong to a few shareholders, ignorant perhaps of the whereabouts of the lines of rails which yield them revenues greater than those of medieval kings. And if the children of those who perished by thousands while excavating the railway cuttings and tunnels were to assemble one day, crowding in their rags and hunger, to demand bread from the shareholders, they would be met with bayonets and grapeshot to disperse them and safeguard vested interests. 
in virtue of this monstrous system, the son of the worker, on entering life, finds no field which he may till, no machine which he may tend, no mine in which he may dig, without accepting to leave a great part of what he will produce to a master. He must sell his labor for a scant and uncertain wage. His father and his grandfather have toiled to drain this field, to build this mill, to perfect this machine. They gave to the work the full measure of their strength, and what more could they give? But their heir comes into the world poorer than the lowest savage. If he obtains leave to till the fields, it is on condition of surrendering a quarter of the produce to his master, and another quarter to the government and the middleman. And this tax, levied upon him by the state, the capitalist, the lord of the manor, and the middleman, it is always increasing. It rarely leaves him the power to improve his system of culture. If he turns to industry, he is allowed to work, though not always even that, only on condition that he yield a half or two-thirds of the product to him whom the land recognizes as the owner of the machine. We cry shame on the feudal baron who forbade the peasant to turn a clod of earth unless he surrendered to his lord of war. Just a little word on the game, uh, just for a second here. Uh, it's not very well labeled, uh, but if you, just to get an idea of what I'm actually doing here, um, so you have different things you can put into this building, your tower. Uh, this tower is kind of cool in that it's uh, literally a, a mixed-use tower, so the new urbanist in me is, is pleased with that part of it. Um, you have your residential, you have your commercial, uh, you have different forms of commerce. Uh, no industry, but you know that's hard to do all in, in the same building. Um, so on, the, on this below ground floor, we have various cafes and, and, and fast food restaurants. Uh, this, this floor here is just the lobby. It's just up the, the Sims get from uh, one elevator to another. This, this is a very big elevator management game, especially in the, in the end parts of it. Um, these rooms here, these are, whoops, uh, these are, oh, uh, get off that. These, these rooms here are uh, condos, so you sell them one time and then the person owns it. There's no actual... Uh, residential renting in this game at all, uh, unless you, I suppose you might be able to consider hotel space uh, a rental. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit of a different category, but anyway, so you have your condos and then uh, this floor up here, this, this highest floor so far is the businesses and you know, they, they pay like once a month and then the, so do the, the uh, cafes and, and fast foods, so that, that's your long term income generation uh, so you yourself are a landlord in this game um, and it goes you can see by this this giant frame here that that can actually be filled by the the entire building eventually so you can go up to 100 stories there's different different things that open up with each of these stars uh, you get like the actual restaurants you get I think staircase but you get things like hotel room access you get um, ballroom and movie theaters eventually you can connect mass transit to them you can put in parking spaces all kinds of stuff i don't know if i'm gonna actually keep on with this game next week because the controls are just so loose like I, I just move the mouse just a tiny bit and it just flies across the screen um so that's not so fun uh it, it's kind of slow and tedious and you know this is a pretty basic game so there's not a whole lot of animation to really keep you going so maybe next week I'll switch to something like a, an early SimCity game, or we'll see if we can even handle a more advanced SimCity game, potentially. But uh, this may be it for SimTower. Uh, you can play it online, though. I'm just doing this at a, it's called Classical, uh, ClassicReloaded.com. Um, you can play it for free online, because I can't, I can't even find it any other form. I used to have a hard disk copy, but I, I guess I've lost that one of my moves so anyway that's just a little bit about the game we'll go back to the program now we'll finish up we only have a few minutes left here so yeah just about six five six minutes left and that'll be the end of first chapter of crop. we call those the barbarous times but if the forms have changed the relations have remained the same and the worker is forced under the name of free contract to accept feudal obligations for turn where he will, he can find no better mm. conditions. Everything mm. has become private property. As you may recall from previous uh, sessions, the 
result of this data. You just mentioned like feudalism, the vestiges of feudalism. Right. That's where the term landlord the comes from. No thought for the needs Actual of the lord of the land who just gets money by virtue of being an owner. Hence the nothing else, nothing special, nothing else contributed really. Industrial prices. Um, Each of they just own the land. He's talking in agricultural terms, but this applies to any landlord. People cannot purchase with their wages the wealth which they have produced. An industry seeks foreign markets among the money classes of other People nations. Getting mad, even in the, the elevator. East, in Africa, everywhere, in Egypt, Tonkin, or the Congo, the European it's is thus bound to promote the growth of serfdom. And so he does. But soon he finds everywhere similar competitors. All the nations evolve on the same lines, and wars, perpetual wars, break out for the right of precedence in the market. Wars for the possession of the East, wars for the empire of the sea. So we're just putting in multiple elevator shafts all along the same column. States. You can see that these different parts interact with each other. The business people go down for lunch to the fast food. Some of the people who work in the building live in the building. They'll just take the elevator up. It's kind of cool. heavily these taxes fall on the workers. Education still remains the privilege of a small minority. For it is idle to talk of education when the workman's child is forced at the age of 13 to go down into the mine or to help his father on the farm. It is idle to talk of studies to the worker who comes home in the evening crushed by excessive toil with its brutalizing atmosphere. Society is thus bound to remain divided into two hostile camps, and in such conditions, freedom is a vain word. Though we've improved some since then, you know, it's, it's not as though uh, kids are, are going to work at, at 13 anymore. Uh, you at least get through a high school education for free. Um, is the end result all that much different? I mean, sure, the jobs are safer in general, um, less dangerous factory work, less dangerous um, uh, mining jobs, things like that. A lot of things, a lot of the most dangerous stuff has been automated in our modern society. But in terms of, of workers, at the bottom and their prospects, is it all that much different? If you only have, say, a fast food job or um, some other low paying job, and it, it's, it has nothing to do with the dignity of, of whatever work you're doing. It's important work regardless, whether you're a garbage collector, a, a fast food worker, um, call center operator, whatever it is, that's, that's not the point, uh, as much as it is how much control do you have over your life? How much of your time is actually your own? Uh, we have the 40 hour work week still, and in a lot of jobs. Um, eventually, I'd like to get to David Graeber. Uh, again, that's going to be another one of those tricky ones because he's a modern author, although he passed in recent years. Um, but uh, he talks about uh, bullshit jobs, and that is jobs that are basically just there on paper and most of the time the worker spends pretending to work uh, in order to run out the clock and collect a paycheck but the, what the, the actual requirements of it are not that much and it's it's not just a lower class thing it's middle management who you know through justifying their own job have workers under them that don't end up doing a whole lot other than you know sucking up to them or, or making them look good or whatever uh, just so they can show how they have management skills and, and you know justify their existence in the company. Um, it's it's menial labor jobs, uh, or called low skill, or, or or yeah low skill jobs, which is a terrible, uh, I would say pejorative misnomer. Every job takes skill. It takes skill to be a fry cook or a, a burger flipper or whatever it has. Whatever, what have you, and anyone who says otherwise, I, I dare you to work uh, just a week in, in the shoes of, of someone who does what you consider to be a no-skill or low-skill job. Uh, where was I going with that? Uh, anyway, yeah, so it's not about the dignity of work. It's not about anything other than how much control you have over your life. And in the time that capitalism has been the dominant form, you might say although I don't even know if it's true anymore, that a greater percentage of people have reached uh, 
a greater level of, of control over their lives, at least monetarily, by reaching the middle class, even if they're not themselves the owner class. Um, so they would have more comfort than and security than past generations, more ability to withstand unexpected life events, stuff like that. But really, uh, just in terms of, of political power, political control, um, and then being the owner of your own time, not a lot has changed in, in the time that capitalism has been the dominant theory. But we do have to work the, the, the weekend thanks to labor, not to capitalism. That's that's thanks to movements that have been forces against capitalism that have, have pried power away from the capitalists who have us working, you know, 18-hour days, uh, six, seven days a week. They don't care. We were just, uh, we're a resource to them. We're, we're fuel to be burned and spent on whatever their project is. Um, so remember that though, every every great leap forward has not been from capitalism just out of it, the goodness of its heart reforming itself. It's from people, labor, demanding reforms, uh, often through violence, especially in the past. Um, so, yeah, that's it's, it's both. It's it's disheartening to think that overall, we we're still under the the rule of capitalism after all this time. That its its myths and and its power structures have have held this long. Uh, but I mean, if you if you look around, it it, it seems like that myth is is losing some of its power at least. Um, with the, with you know stuff like bread tube, uh, people have in their, their spare moments time to to dream of something more, and get out of the the binary you know conservative liberal mindset, dream beyond that border. Um, so who knows? Maybe things will end up changing eventually, but uh, it starts with people getting better ideas and that's that's a big reason why I do what I do. So let's uh, let's finish this off here. The radical begins by demanding a greater extension of political rights, but he soon sees that the breadth of liberty leads to the uplifting of the proletariat and then he turns around, changes his opinions and reverts to repressive legislation and government by the sword. A vast array of courts, judges, executioners, policemen and jailers is needed to uphold these privileges. And this array gives rise in its turn to a whole system of espionage, of false witness, of spies, of threats and corruption. The system under which we live checks in its turn the growth of the social sentiment. We all know that without uprightness, There's without self-respect, without sympathy and mutual aid, humankind must perish, as perish the two races of animals are. living by the sea, or the, the slave-keeping ants. But such right. ideas are not to the taste of the ruling classes, and they have elaborated a whole system of pseudoscience to teach the contrary. Fine sermons have been preached on the text that those who have should share with those who have not, but he who would act out this principle is speedily informed that these beautiful sentiments are all very well in poetry, but not in practice. To lie is to degrade and besmirch oneself, we say, and yet all civilized life becomes one huge lie. We accustom ourselves and our children to hypocrisy, to the practice of a double-faced morality. And since the brain is ill at ease among lies, we cheat ourselves with sophistry. Hypocrisy and sophistry become the second nature of the civilized man. But a society cannot live thus. It must return to truth or cease to exist. Thus the consequences which spring from the original act of monopoly spread through the whole of social life. Under pain of death, human societies are forced to return to first principles. The means of production being the collective work of humanity, the product should be the collective property of the race. Individual appropriation is neither just nor serviceable. All belongs to all. All for all. all. things are for that's, all that's men. That's one of his central since principles. All men have need of them, since all men have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it is not possible to evaluate everyone's part in the production of the world's wealth. All things are for all. Here is an immense stock of tools and implements. 
here are all those iron slaves which we call machines, which saw and flame, spin and weave for us, unmaking and remaking, working up raw matter to produce the marvels of our time. But nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, this is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products, any more than the feudal lord of medieval times had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belongs to me, and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap, on every rick you build. All is for all. If the man and the woman bear their fair share of work, they have a right to their fair share of all that is produced by all and that share is enough to secure them well-being. No more of such vague formulas as the right to work, or to each the whole result of his labor. Right what we work. proclaim is the right to well-being, well-being for all. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. And there you, you can have find it. more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. And again, you just go to Audible Anarchist in YouTube. Oh, yeah. Tons and tons of books and short pamphlets, um, all sorts of stuff. So I, I highly recommend them again. Uh, Audible Anarchist or an Audible Anarchism. Uh, this is Audible Anarchist. All right, so there you have it. Audible Anarchist. Let's hope that lines up. No, you can't really see that, can you? Oh, that's way over there. Oh, well. You'll we'll just uh, rearrange the window because we're done with the. Whoops. We're done with the game for tonight. <laughs> the game was a bit frustrating, I must say. Just the controls. So messed up. So, yeah, that's the introduction to A Conquest of Bread. Uh, let me know what you think. Did that, that spark any new ideas in you? Did that uh, make you look at things in a, in a different light? Think, you know, things like. Uh, I mean, does that make you question property rights uh, at all? Does it make you um, does that make you look at the way that uh, cities are laid out any different? Uh, does it make you look any differently on the way cities are laid out or, or who they're for? Um, if it's just to claim ownership in, in the way that uh, capitalists do, uh, or if perhaps we should be looking to move towards more of the system of all for all because we all are, are products of and, and benefactors of uh, the riches of, of past generations um, and their stored wealth of knowledge and, and goodwill and, and humanity to the generations that came after them. You, know, you may think that's a, a bit of a, like a pie in the sky sort of um, way of looking at it, you know, say, oh yeah, that, that's nice all for all, but how would, a, how would a civilization actually function like that? I mean, you, you have to have order and, and, and strict laws or people are just going to all steal from each other. Well, in the next chapters, we'll go into uh, how a civilization could function like that. And uh, I invite you to suspend your disbelief just a little bit and uh, consider what he has to say, because uh, I think if you I think you'll see that um, perhaps once people have their needs met, that kind of shifts the entire equation. And, uh, you know, in, in Kropotkin's mind, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but in Kropotkin's mind, uh, once that shift occurs, no one will accept going back to the current system. Once, once people's needs are met, that's it. That's all they'll accept is in the future having a basic standard of living for everybody. Uh, regardless of ability to produce, regardless of social standing or, or legacy of family or lottery of birth or what have you, uh, even regardless of, of education. Does so everyone have a, a level playing field to, to start from uh, that includes all the necessities of life? All right, so that's the end of the chapter for this week. Uh, thank you very much for, for watching. Before I go, though, I want to do my boost.